and silver or gold, I'd rather have Jesus than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be filled by His nail-pierced hand. Good morning, good morning to all as we get ourselves settled in and ready to rock. Hello. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let's see who's up there thus far. I have Sherry and Gloria and Sue and Julie and Buddy. What a splendid way to start the morning with some of my very favorite friends in the whole world. It's so good to see you all. It's good to have you all aboard. And those of you that will be joining us or will join us later in the day or at another time, we pray God's blessing on each of you. All right. As we get ready to go, as I said yesterday, we'll finish up chapter 12 today, uh, looking at that last point that uh, we started looking at uh, yesterday. Good morning, Pam. Uh, we really do live in a time when the uh oh carolyn and rosa pops in as well okay we live in a time where the mindset uh is that if it's old it's really not worthwhile we prefer uh, the modern to the historical uh, society craves the new constantly uh there's always pressure to get the latest gadget the latest thing the newest phone or whatever that's what my kids are pressing at us right now is that we need to upgrade our phones. They're getting, you know, technology is, well, you know the story. Uh, people think that whatever man thought 300 years ago uh, has been, needs to be, will always be improved upon. We see ourselves as a, good morning Ruth, we see ourselves as a more sophisticated uh, society and much more intelligent. Uh, we've sent men to the moon, we split the atom, we've created computers and smart cars and therefore it's concluded that modern man is just so advanced. For example, in our progressive, progressive culture, uh, we believe that the ideas of morality have been much improved upon, uh, say for example, the morality of the Puritans. Modern thinking you know, uh, holds those kind of morals uh, and any puritanical thought as an object of ridicule, of mockery. Uh, such high standards of ethics and conduct are considered to be unsophisticated and unsound and just not with it. Today, the moral ethic that is involved from our enlightenment is nothing more than 
the old amorality and and immorality and it it says if it feels good then it must be moral well I don't find that much of an improvement really modern uh, or better yet poor postmodern man uh, also has a contempt for any kind of classical historical view of God the view of God that conservative evangelical Christians have is considered to be old-fashioned and archaic and any adherence to scripture becomes laughable to the present age of modern wisdom to maintain the view of God that was held by earlier generations is just simply out of touch with progressive religion according to the intellectual man knows so much more now than he did a hundred years ago and with with his growth in knowledge has come well, supposedly a more enlightened view of God. People today refuse to be saddled uh, with an old view of God that cramps their lifestyle. The problem with this is postmodern man has made one major mistake in his rationale about God and that's about the nature of truth. He chose to ignore the, ignore the fact that uh, uh, if it's truth, truth cannot be changed. If something was true uh, a thousand years ago, that something is true today. Truth is not subject to the modern evolutionary concept. And the reason for that is that uh, God is the beginning point of all truth, since he's the creator of all things. Jesus said of himself, I am the truth. And you remember when he stood before Pilate and he's talking about bearing the truth. Pilate scoffed and said, well, what's the truth? And Jesus said, I'm the truth. Uh, God doesn't evolve. He cannot do so. He is immutable, unchangeable. If, if he was truth and all things we understand about him were true, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago. It is true today and it will be a 1,000 years from now. If truth originated with man, then truth can be changed because we always change. That's the very nature of man. But man cannot establish reality since man is not the creator. Reality can only come from the very one who created all that is real, and that someone is God. Therefore, whatever was true about God is going to always be true of God. And the writer of Hebrews has provided a clear presentation for any argument on God's immutability. Whatever is said about God in the Old Testament concerning his person and his character has not changed. He is the same God. We don't have a new God in the New Testament. God didn't all of a sudden, uh, somewhere between Malachi and Matthew, make this massive transition to some other being. The God of the Old Testament. You know, and I've had people say, well, yeah, boy, that's it, Old Testament God. Well, that Old Testament God is also a New Testament God. To say that the New Testament gave only one view or perspective of God would be totally wrong. But it's also wrong for us to emphasize any particular view of God uh, to the exclusion of all others. Or to ignore some biblical presentations of God because we don't like what they show us we don't understand them. One of the views of God that the writer wants to remind the readers of is our God is a consuming fire. Think about that. That's kind of an Old Testament concept. In this present ever vacillating world, we need to see this presentation of God. 
in a world that thinks it has improved upon its understanding of God, this view must be lifted up and given equal weight to the other views of God that we have. No man will ever know God fully and completely. Jesus said that, no man can know God, only the Son. Now we can get a glimpse, a glimmer of understanding, enough to sustain us and save us and so on and so forth, but we will never know the depths of the reality of God. Father, we come acknowledging you that you are the great and awesome, almost completely unknowable God who has chosen to make himself known. You are so far above man that our tiny little brains cannot comprehend the immensity and the greatness of our God. We would be just simply like an ant trying to figure out a man. And we're the ant. You are awesome, glorious, and great, and fearful. And I think, Lord, sometimes we emphasize so many other aspects of your character, and we miss lifting up also how fearful you are, how awe-inspiring you are, how and Lord, to use what the prophet said, how terrible you are. And not terrible in the sense of being horrible, but terrible in the sense of your, your power and your immensity. Who can comprehend our God? Lord, I pray that you open to our understanding and give us more clarity on this aspect of your nature, Lord. To you be praise and carry us through this day, Lord, in Jesus' name. Well, as we come to the lesson, I told you we would be looking at uh, uh, the last of, of three points. We began looking at the, the five, last of the five warnings that the author gives us here in Hebrews. And uh, we considered the three of four points on this last section. Uh, one, uh, we said that, uh, let's move this along. There we go. God has appointed a great earthquake that will bring this world to a close. That final shaking of the earth and the heavens that someday will end with this fallen creation, uh, with this creation falling, every, everything that we know being wiped away uh, in God's final judgment. Now, that's the part that, that you know, well, that's all, that's, that's just old-fashioned type of fire and brimstone preaching we don't need today. Well, uh, I think we need to remind ourselves that we cannot ignore this aspect of God's character or what he said is going to transpire. Before that great shaking come, God has appointed that there will be an increase in, in, in the frequency and intensity of, of earthquakes and other calamities, natural and man-made. Leading up to that, uh, the great end, the way uh, labor pains uh, is, uh, marks the coming of a child, and the third point that we looked at the, yesterday, uh, come on, work for me, will you? For some reason my finger don't want to work. Before the end of the age, God in his great mercy is offering to everyone who believes in his son a kingdom that cannot be shaken and will never end. Those are the three that we looked at. Now, uh, I want to spend the remainder of the time today looking at that fourth point. 
so that we get a clearer understanding, I believe, of what the author wants us to know. Uh, and we're going to look at it in the in in its in a more total than just the the destruction and judgment that's coming. I, I think it means much more than that. And that fourth one is our God is a consuming fire. Uh, it, it begins that that section that last point with the word therefore, and he says therefore since we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken let us show gratitude by which we may offer God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Now what is meant by the fact that our God is a consuming fire? In the Old Testament, God uh, is stated as being a consuming fire. The same words describe God in the New Testament. So again, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. I know the wisdom of our age tells us that uh, uh, we have made great advances upon the Old Testament revelation, but you know that's only in our own mind because there was no advances to be made uh, because uh, God is, is true to himself. The revelation that Moses saw of God the very uh, the the very first time that he saw him was a consuming fire. Remember when Moses met God at the burning bush, the fire was consuming the bush, though the bush wasn't being destroyed by the fire. Uh, so let's discuss just for a moment the characteristics of fire, and I think with that help emphasize what we learn about the nature of God. The first thing, and, and, and I'll start, you know, probably at, at, at the judgment end of things and move forward. Uh, fire destroys. I've worked enough fires, seen enough fires to know what fire can do, and, and so do you. The Lord displayed his judgment against Israel by using fire. In Numbers chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, When the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and that's even a fiery term, isn't it? The, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. So we understand that, that, that fire represents, in the Old Testament, God's judgment, doesn't it? His wrath, his anger. That's understandable. Of course, this is part, this is probably the, the core part of everything that the writer of Hebrews is saying, is that God is going to consume. He's going to, to, to wipe away. Peter says that everything is stored in fire, and he said when this world passes away, it'll be with a great boom and everything will just kind of kind of melt. Uh, but God has always used the image of, of fire to represent the character of his righteous wrath and judgment. The prophet uh, Nahum compares the anger of God to fire when he says, who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. If you refuse Christ, you will know the fury of his fire, of his anger, of his wrath, and you'll be consumed in its flames. For God is a consuming fire. And uh, fire, the fire of God destroys everything. His raging flames cannot be controlled or put out by man. There is no retardation of those flames. In the book of Daniel, the three Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar's idol. Now this so infuriated the king that he ordered his furnace to be heated up seven times hotter than normal. It was so hot that those who threw the Hebrew dissidents into the furnace died from the heat that was being emanated from that furnace. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent, the furnace had been made extremely hot, and the flames of the fire slew the men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. 
They bound them. These men carried them up. Probably, probably six men, two to each each one of these uh, uh, Jewish men, and they heaved them into this furnace. But the flames, the heat was so great that it consumed the men. There was no protection for these men. You might look at that as a sign of judgment in itself. However, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't go into the furnace without protection. They went into the flames with another. Therefore, they couldn't be consumed by this, this fire of judgment. Remember, this is a picture of Nebuchadnezzar's judgment on these three who refused to bow down to his image. But his judgment was an unrighteous judgment, but God used that same judgment fire to consume those who would harm his, but those judgment flames couldn't touch Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astounded and stood up in haste, and he said to the high officials, was it not three men we cast in, bound into the midst of the fire? And they replied to the king, certainly, O king. And he said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth was like, now get this, the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near the door of the furnace, far enough that he and get burned up, a blazing fire, and responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. You servants of the Most High God, come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out in the midst of the fire. God is a consuming fire. And if a person faces judgment without a covering, they will be destroyed and consumed for all eternity. I think the beauty of that, that, that scene, that story there that we just read is the idea that these men went in bound into the fire. Jesus being in their midst, though, these men were free in the fire. Their bind, bound, bonds were burnt off and they were walking around enjoying fellowship with God, no matter what the world's flames were throwing at them. But the lesson there is, if you go into the fire without a covering, then you're going to be consumed. Now Paul says the same thing to the Thessalonians in the first chapter of his second letter. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to you as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. How? In flaming fire, dealing out retribution for those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay a penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And we know where that place of, uh, of destruction is. It's called the lake of fire. We know it as hell. Fire means judgment. Fire destroys. Fire judges. But let's move to another idea. Fire also purifies. The furnace purifies the most precious of metals. Its flames re, refine the, and cleanses and burns off that which is impure. God is ever perfecting his saints and burning the dross of impurities that remain within us. His holy flame as it is licks in our heart and the burning holiness of his righteousness is searing all impurities. Have you ever applied heat or fire to, to a cut or something to carterize it? I did that one time when, when I was out hunting and, and I'd cut myself and, and I didn't have a way and I, I carterized the wound. 
as Malachi tells us in Malachi in 3 and verse 3. He says, uh, and he will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present the Lord offerings in righteousness. It is the testing that God allows us to go through. We looked at that earlier in the week, didn't we? It is the testing that God allows us to go through that brings purification into our life, burning off everything that doesn't look like him. He does it because he loves us and calls us his people as we call him our God. Zechariah 13, 9 says, I will bring the third part through the fire. Talking about the separation of God. I'll bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested, and that's again a smelting process. And they will call on my name, and I will answer them and say, They are my people, and they will say, The Lord is my God. So don't be surprised when fiery trials come your way, because the flames will not hurt you because they're only designed to consume the dross of your life and your gold to refine. First Peter and chapter 1 and verses 6 through 9 says, uh, this, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith be more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found as a result in praise and glory and honor and revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory obtaining as an outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. The fire of God brings light to darkness and exposes our sin. It exposes what we don't know exists or we want to put away and not pay attention to. That's the business of fire. That's the business of fire as light to expose the things hidden in darkness. This is the privilege of the child of God. This is the experience that all of us have on the king's highway. It is that beautiful, wonderful, sanctifying process that God puts his people through. The last thing I want you to see about the characteristics of, 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 of fire and, and God as uh, uh, consuming fire is fire is energy. Fire is productive. I used to love to go out to the, the generator plant at, uh, at Salt, River, Salt River plant out in St. John's where, where Steve was. And there would, uh, you know, there's this ball of fire in the middle of that generator there they're shooting the coal dust in and it, it just is suspended in this beautiful ball of fire fire's energy it's productive it produces god as fire consumes in order to empower his servants it's it was john the baptist who said that christ would baptize the holy spirit and with fire and on that long-awaited day of Joel's prophecy, the fire of God descended on 120 hungry souls. The consuming fire of God ignited the 12 apostles and 108 other followers of Christ, and they received an empowerment that changed the world. And today, its effects are still being felt because we're still living in that, that, that fire-induced passion. We are the results of the fire of Pentecost. The book of Acts is a testimony to the fact that God empowers his church. 
And the only power sufficient for the church is the fire of God. Before leaving his small band of followers, Jesus commanded them to wait and, and, and tarry in Jerusalem. He says, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And by the way, remember John the Baptist saying he'll baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up, and while they were looking on, the cloud received him out of their sight. And then the Bible tells us they obeyed, and they waited for the promise of the power. And when the day of Pentecost was, had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly... There came uh, uh, from heaven a noise of a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves and resting on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Perhaps they obeyed for no other reason than the Lord commanded them to do so. But I, I think they felt the enormity of the task of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And they knew that without God granting them supernatural power, they were woefully inadequate. These men were just fishermen and uh, for, for the most part, you know, common laborers. Uh, later it was said of them that they were ignorant which, and, and unlearned, which meant that they were educated in the seminary and universities of the day. And the apostles, along with others, knew all too well the certainty of failure if they did not wait on what the Lord had commanded. And so they waited, and the fire fell. The scene is reminiscent of when God filled the tabernacle or, 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 or the temple. In Second Chronicles in 7, and verses 1 through 3, it says, Now when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests could see, yeah, we get that, and, and, and the priests could, could, could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the house. And all the sons of Israel, seeing the fire come down, and the glory of the Lord upon the house bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground. And they worshiped and gave praise to the Lord, saying, Truly he is good. Truly his loving kindness is everlasting. You see, the fire led them to worship and acknowledge the goodness and greatness of God. I'm convinced that this is God's procedure, that he, that he works through his people whom the fire of the Spirit energizes. He has not asked us to apply our strength and knowledge to bless him. On the contrary, it's God's method to empower each believer for service and the service that God has uniquely designed them to do. He is always meant to grant a fire of power to the weak and the infirm and therefore bring him glory. Paul understood he, 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 he could not uh, rely on his, his own power and his own knowledge to persuade men uh, you know, concerning the claims of Christ. He writes to Corinth, he says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message to you and my preaching was not a persuasive words of wisdom. Paul refused the power of the flesh that he might be empowered with the power of the Holy Spirit so he could, so, so he goes on to say to the Christians, the Corinthians in the very next verse, but was demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith could not rest on the wisdom of men but on the power of God it is the power of God that is in 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 that we need today a fresh fire we need to live coals from the altar of God to touch us oh that God would do it again today
What we need is what Elijah experienced on Mount Carmel as he stood before Israel and called them back to God and challenged the very prophets of Baal. And after he prayed, the fire fell. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came and near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are the God of Israel, and I am your servant, and I have done these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their backs, and turned their back, their heart back again. And then the Bible records this, and then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their face and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. May God consume our lives with his holy fire as he consumed the sacrifice in Elijah's day. And on the day of Pentecost, may the fire of God rest upon us. Yeah, our God is a consuming fire. God's fire destroys, judges, consumes those who turn their backs on God's plea of mercy and love and grace. And yes, when judgment comes, this earth will be judged in fire. And those who have rejected him will be turned out to the judgment of fire. But remember, God is giving every opportunity available for men to turn to him and experience grace and love and peace and mercy. God's fire also purifies each who by faith come to God through their son, his son, Jesus Christ. He works his sanctifying power in the life of each and every one of his children. And yes, God's fire consumes us, empowers each of us to be his witnesses and to serve him in those unique ways that God has designed each one of us as, as we follow him. So I guess my, my plea and desire for all of us is that his fire would fall on each of us, fresh and new. Gracious Lord, we do come with gratitude and thanksgiving and worship as the writer of Hebrews says we ought to, because you are a consuming fire. I always get this idea when I read Romans 12, 1 of this altar and how we are to put ourselves upon that altar that we might be fully and totally consumed by you. There upon the altar, your fire to fall upon our lives and absolutely consume us. Lord, that we may give our very bodies, our entire being to you as a holy sacrifice, one that is acceptable to you. Lord, we understand from what Paul says that that is our reasonable and worshipful act of service. So Lord, I would pray that this day, since this is the only day that you've given us, each of us will seek you that you might consume every part of our thought life, every part of our, our action life, every part of everything that we are. May we yield up all to you, Lord, as those who are alive from the dead. And the members, Lord, may we give all of us to your righteousness. Thank you, Lord, for your word and that we can come together today around it. Thank you for these precious ones that join as we study together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you have a deeper appreciation or insight 
to what it is that uh, the author is intending when he says our God is a consuming fire. I'd like you to take some time today to, uh, to list out uh, other characteristics of fire that you might see in Scripture or understand and, and, and that are applied to God and write them down. I've just shared three with you. But uh, look at times that God has uh, uh, empowered you or his fire, if it were, worked and moved through your life and give him glory and praise and worship. Then, over the weekend, today, encourage others, maybe reaching out to somebody that uh, uh, you can say, hey, listen, we're in services on Sunday morning, uh, we're online, how would you like to join me? How would you like to, to watch with me? We can discuss you know, later, but, but always be reaching out, always be touching somebody's life. I'm gonna go now, I'm going to let you get to your day. I'm going to get down to the office and get a couple of things done. And it was just so good to be with you guys this morning. May God bless. Serve him. Serve him. Uh, be that living sacrifice today. God bless.